world of today, luggage economy can at best help with basic infrastructural development. It cannot lead to a democratization of wealth and a speedy creation of a new class of wealth creators. For sure, there is room for some luggageism, I'm calling it the word, at the apex of economic activity. But there is a limit to how that model can make billionaires of citizens not born into wealth or who do not have access to illicit funds. On the contrary, knowledge economy places emphasis on the power of human imagination to use know-how and know-why to create business opportunities through new entrepreneurship models. In this new economy, the son of a Yoruba carpenter like me, or the daughter of a Fulani ex-man, or perhaps the cousin of an Ijo fisherman who excels in school and acquires the proficiency in IT, basic engineering, or entrepreneurship, can break through all known barriers to emerge quickly with a product or service that the mass market wants. In the process, they can achieve in a few years what the purveyors of the luggage economy could not achieve in so many years, both in terms of aggregate capital accumulation and net contribution to the GDP. Before going further, let me say quickly that given the circumstance of our country today, we need a mix of both luggage economy and knowledge economy. But my worry is the current fixation with the former without much consideration for the latter. Yes, we need people to grow food. We need people to manufacture things. And we need people to buy and sell. But we are not even doing any of those things well. And education accounts mostly for why. With greater application of knowledge, we can do things much smarter, much more efficiently, and much more productively. If you look at the main engine of America's old luggage economy, like DuPont, Bechtel, and others, you will discover that none of them is anywhere close to, say, Microsoft, in spite of their sheer acreage of real estate and quantum of iron, steel, and concrete with which they litter the American landscape. So obviously, one system is creating more wealth with less manual effort than the other, while at the same time impacting lives on universal scales. If you take the total net worth of finders and drivers of Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Dell, Yahoo, Oracle, and all the rest, you will be shocked that each of them is many times richer than the total external reserves of all the West African countries combined. If you look at nations, you may also discover that Japan and Germany have depended less on extractive resources like minerals and more on products of human ingenuity like engineering, even though they laid their engineering infrastructure in the era of luggage economy. Today they are earning, they, they, they are earning their work mostly through knowledge. Therefore, if we must develop as a nation, our mentality must shift from luggage to knowledge. But how can such happen when the first requirement to register a university in Nigeria is for the investor to acquire 100 acres of land? Yes, you got me right. It is in our law. So even for a sector like, educa like education, the emphasis is still on luggage rather than on knowledge. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we make a distinction between luggage economy and knowledge economy, let me now go to the question posed by Pastor Koju. What is the economic value of Nigeria? Put differently, if Nigeria were for sale today, what aspects of our country would interest prospective investors? Let me say without any equivocation that the strongest economic value of our country today is the ingenuity of our young people who must be given the opportunity to champion their own recovery through innovation and creativity. If we ever needed any proof that our young people are the most valuable assets, the recent visit to Nigeria by the founder of Facebook was a testimony. At co-creation of Afrin Noli, Andela, and a host of other places, Sutabat visited in Lagos. There's a new visitor of hope for our young developers and engineers in the tech industry who are working several hubs across the country. The atmosphere has changed as it is now evident that Nigeria is a destination for venture capitalists in the industry. There is even more hope for young Nigeria's developers building solutions around all sectors of our economy, from transportation to civic engagement, healthcare, sports, and agriculture. 
Therefore, it is sad, if not tragic, that the authorities still cannot understand that building the future is about developing solutions and apps that are capable of generating income and new employment. I am aware that at Co-Creation of Biaba, there's a yearly summer coding camp for children, developing localized applications and picking up new skills for, to better their future. What Bosut Jani and Femi Longa started in 2011 is now becoming a gold mine before our very own eyes. Just about five years after, we now have Budget, Efico, Mamalet, Autobox, Proof, and many are still coming up from that home. Looking at the model of Andela, co-founded by Inyolua Abuyeji in 2014, it is incredible that in just two years, hundreds of developers, hundreds of Developers have been trained through his fellowship scheme and boot camps. In Yolua, a young Nigerian social entrepreneur with several years of experience running solo ventures in education technology and publishing, recently announced his exit from Andela to venture into a new startup. Such bold steps can only be attributed to the kind of future we want to build, a future that is tied to providing knowledge-based solutions to practical problems. To build the future, we need the strength of young Nigerians like Tayo Fiosu, who confounded Paga, a mobile payments business. The platform recently crossed a threshold of 3 million users, with over 800,000 of them active. And now it's over, and now it has over 8,000 agents in 35 of our uh, 36 states in the country. With Paga, which now boasts over 200 employees, Nigerian customers can easily transfer money, purchase airtime credit, and pay bills with your cell phones. With Paga, mobile money has become a reality in Nigeria through thinking ahead by some of our young nationals. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we must build the future like Gosi Ko Ukan Woke is already doing through the establishment of Nigeria's first online university. Gosi has taken advantage of our country's internet users base to establish Benny University, Benny American University, with several fac faculties already recruited to provide on-site human capital development for businesses and flexibility of study for individuals. Beauty the future is like what Shoma Aguebo is doing with the Abuja-based startup Tech R that is creating a community for young women working in and around technology, helping them to learn together and supporting one another. Tech R is committed to producing young female developers by connecting them to resources and business opportunities. Another leading light in the growing tech ecosystem in Nigeria is Mark Essien, the co-founder of Hotels NG, one of Nigeria's go-to places for hotel bookings. Then you have Bankole Cardozo, founder and CEO of Easy Taxi in Nigeria, which is making it easy for passengers to book taxis anywhere and anytime with the click of a button. Last year, I spoke about Bikis Adebi Yadibo Abiola, co-founder and CEO of We Cyclers Corporation. And then there is Jason Njoku, co-founder of Iroko TV, an online entertainment platform that targets audiences in South Saharan Africa. This year, Jason secured $90 million in funding from French premium cable company Canal Plus. Of course, we have Afion Williams, the young CEO of Refoods who recently made the Forbes list of 30 under 30 entrepreneurs on the continent by using brain power to make agriculture an interesting and money-making venture for young people. The future in agriculture, for instance, is to deliberately increase the value chain. That is what Fatima Ademo, one of the final contestants, chosen from about 800 young entrepreneurs for a business ideas competition, term a Greek beast for Africa is doing today. Let me not forget Adeta Yobamiduro and Chinedu Azodo, who co-founded Metro African Express, a logistics company that boasts of real-time delivery of goods, including within chaotic cities like your own, that is Lagos. And finally, let me speak about a remarkable young man I admire so much. In the 80s, when I used to spend In the 80s, when I used to spend my holiday with my elder brother in Oile Gamun, Lagos, there was this popular artist called Adelov, renamed Adel Yemi Afolayan, who 
who else from my state quarrel even as young as i was back then i could see efforts and talents that were not commensurate with the reward but with knowledge his son Tuli Afolanyi, has taken the same craft to a non-presidential level reaping bountifully in the process all within a short time I'm an ardent fan of Kunle Aflayan because there is rigor and creativity in his works. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, are we ready to build the future? That is the question. Because if we are, we must demonstrate that in the way we manage our affairs and in our politics. We have all read and heard stories about how Singapore moved from the third world to first world. But what is Ali spoken about is the leadership, leadership recruitment process that places huge emphasis on knowledge. Currently, Singapore has a cabinet of 20, the prime minister, two deputy prime ministers, and 17 cabinet ministers. Now let me quickly run down the qualifications of these people. I begin with the prime minister, Li Long, who attended University of Cambridge, where he graduated with a first class degree in mathematics and diploma in computer science with distinction after which he completed a Master of Administration 